Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Steve Hobson, editor of Motor Transport, and here is my esteemed panel. Um, right, I'm going to go around very quickly, just ask you all to introduce yourselves and just give a very, very quick overview of what you see in a minute or two as the key challenges for truck manufacturers into the future. We'll start with you, uh, Arif, please. Okay, so um, um, hello, everyone. So my name is Arif Jaffaji. I'm the Business Development, Marketing and IT Director for Scania. Um, so um, I guess the future. So th there's a lot of things happening, um, you know, from, from a kind of a... Um, an environment point of view. So, um, you know, we have a lot of, you know, there's urbanization, um, you know, there's the society is, is looking much more um, in terms of um, from an environmental factor, you know, be that CO2 or be that kind of particulates and sort of air quality. Um, so I think all of these things are going to massively, massively impact our industry. So from a Scania perspective, um, you know, we're really looking to be the um, leader in sustainable transport solutions. That's, that's really what we're about. Um, and I guess what that means is sustainable to us is, is a combination of there's business, um, there's environment, and there's society. Um, and actually, what can we do to kind of you know, impact all those? So we have a sustainable business, we have a sustainable society, um, and we have a sustainable environment. And, and obviously, there's lots of technologies which we're looking at in terms of you know, different types of vehicles, um, you know, different kinds of, um, I guess, power and um, you know, those kind of things, um, linking that through to kind of digitalization and connectivity. Um, and I think all of these things, um, you know, coming together will probably, you know, impact the future and actually how do we kind of uh, look at those kind of opportunities and challenges. Great, thank you. Martin, what's your vehicle's vision of the future? Yeah, good, good afternoon everyone. Martin Flack, I'm Alternative Fuels Director for Iveco in UK and Republic of Ireland. Um, I think we'll all pretty much say we're going to be the leader in sustainable transport. Um, so I'll pick up on what Arif has just said. We're one of the leaders in sustainable transport. We've been at it for many years. Um, the big challenge we see at the moment, very much picking up as well on the, the stuff that Richard Burnett was showing and Phil has just been showing, we're now in a situation where the general public are very anti-diesel. Our business runs on diesel vehicles. So the challenge for us and the challenge for me personally is what do we do to move away from diesel? Um, and the answer is that there isn't really a one solution that fits all size. So the chart which Phil was showing with electric vehicles down the bottom, gas vehicles up the top, is very much where we see it going. I think we would probably add into that the opportunity that if you have a vehicle which is running long distance on the motorway and then going into the urban environment, we need to have last mile, last five miles, last 10 miles, whatever it needs to be, capability to be zero emission. So as we move forward, we need to get to that point. Gas vehicles are already a very good stepping stone in that we can get a CO2 benefit, we can get a NOx benefit. More importantly than just NOx benefit, we get a benefit in NO2. It's the NO2 is the nasty bit of the NOx, and that's the bit which um, you get a particularly good benefit with a gas vehicle. Challenge always is to get the government to actually accept that and to be encouraging the industry to take up gas vehicles, both with simple things like the vehicle we've got in the uh, display out there, it cost me £1,800 to tax that vehicle. That's the same as a diesel vehicle. That's wrong. We should have an incentive to do a taxing on the vehicle, which is going to be um, giving the message to everybody that there's an opportunity to do something to help the environment. Um, moving forward, where do we see? Big challenge, obviously, 4x2 vehicles at the moment available. We've got 6x2 vehicles coming this year. The UK market, 10% 4x2s, 90% 6x2s on Arctic. So it's great for us to be able to be offering a 6x2 gas vehicle in the latter part of this year. So I look forward to seeing you all afterwards and taking your orders. Great, thank you. Phil? Hi, Phil Moon. I'm Marketing Manager for Daft Trucks. Um, I think we've all heard today how we're, we seem to be on the cusp of a significant change. For decades, we've been pretty confident that diesel has been the right power source. Uh, and, I, and I actually believe that diesel will be with us for some time to come. But in certain applications, it's clear that to meet environmental uh, and um, societal uh, objectives, 
we're going to see much more of a, uh, a mixed bag in terms of fuel sources. Mm. And really, as a manufacturer, our challenge is actually to understand how that change will affect our customers' businesses. We need to have a range of products and services and solutions that meet the, the, the changing needs of you, our customers. And I'm sure many people don't really know what the next five or 10 years will mean to their businesses. So as a manufacturer trying to anticipate, develop and plan products to suit such a massive change in, uh, in customer demand is a real challenge. And I think that's the, the, the hard bit. Um, I think there's, uh, that we can't disguise the fact that developing new technologies, new systems is incredibly difficult, but understanding where the market will be in the next five or 10 years time is the real challenge that we all face as an industry. Absolutely. Thomas. Actually, I think the next 10 years will be the most interesting years within the last 100 years of the mm. commercial vehicle industry. Honestly speaking, I personally think there's no clear answer where we are heading to. And I actually personally think the reputation of the diesel engine is by far worse than it is. And I see clear future for the next 10, 15, even 20 years for the diesel engine. Obviously, you need to differentiate between the range, <coughs> city distribution, intercity, long haul. Actually, we as MIN, um, we are leading in the CNG technology in the bus business. Um, currently in the truck uh, business, we focus all our activities on e-mobility. We will hand over the first nine fully electric uh, HTVs, 26 tonners and tractors to nine customers. But if you'd really ask me where the future is going to be, I couldn't tell you this. I personally think, as I said, diesel will be the future. And if you consider from Euro 1 to Euro 6, um, the NOx and the parts uh, have reduced by 95%. And I think from a marketing point of view for the diesel engine, we need to do much more. However, as an OEM, we need to be prepared for everything. The technical solutions are there. And as I said, the next 10 years will be amazing. And I'm personally very happy to be a part of this journey. Great. Yes, it is going to be very, very interesting. I mean, listening to the presentations this morning, it all sounds like great news for all you guys, because Euro 6 is going to be the answer, it seems. So I'm sure you've got long queues of people dying to chop in their used Euro 5s and buy Euro 6. But isn't the problem that the confusion and the uncertainty caused by all the changes in legislation, not knowing what's happening with local authorities? We haven't talked about direct vision standards in London. Are people putting off buying decisions because of uncertainty? Is actually the uncertainty leading to a reduction in demand for this very clean technology, which we all accept is very clean, but people are reluctant to buy even clean diesel because they're not sure if they can use it in the next 10 to 20 years? I don't know who's picked that up first, a volunteer, Thomas? Um, actually, in the truck uh, business unit, we don't face this problem at all. Demand is still pretty high. Um, on the bus and coach, interestingly enough, especially in the coach business, we see a huge decline in the demand because obviously the co coach operators with the tourists going into the big cities and they don't really know what to do. Market is down by 30% and we are really facing issues because there is no transparency what will be the future look like? But truck-wise, currently, I'm constantly amazed, facing Brexit, obviously, next mm. year, how big the demand is, and, and total market forecast is still pretty high, which is great for us, obviously. Phil? Yeah, I, I think um, uh, the numerous different pressures uh, or influences on future vehicle requirements um, actually illustrates the absolute desperate need for clarity of thought, um, thoroughly uh, researched and developed legislative um, requirements, whether they be local, regional, national or international, I think manufacturers like operators need foresight of those requirements and short term local um, strategies can actually work very detrimentally. And I think a number of people have mentioned today one of the potential downfalls of uh, introducing clean air zones, zones might be that we actually move from highly efficient large vehicles and we actually push the market to, to a van-based mm. society mm. which will in increase congestion, cause downstream effects on, um, yeah. uh, on, on traffic flow and on emissions and actually it could actually have the, uh, the, the counter effect that uh, everybody is, uh, is seeking. 
Marty, what do you think? I, I think um, the key thing is that when we talk about clarity, um, is to see clarity not just on a national scale, but on a local scale as well. Um, what we can't, you know, as manufacturers, we all work on the European and worldwide stage. We produce vehicles that we sell in every country. Um, it's impossible to produce a vehicle for Coventry that's different to a vehicle for Birmingham, that's different to a vehicle for London. You've got to have a standard that is for Europe or a standard which is a worldwide standard. You can't even really go to a UK standard. The UK market is not big enough to justify investment to produce a vehicle specifically for the UK. Yeah, it's bad enough with 6x2 Arctics, which are largely a UK vehicle. It's difficult for us to justify the investment to do a 6x2 Arctic when you look at the whole picture. Now we do it, and thank God that we do, because I wouldn't have a job otherwise. Um, but the key thing really is one that we need to get this standardization, we need to get harmonization, and the only way we do that is by doing it on an international basis. The Mayor for London making his rules is not the answer. Arif, are you seeing a reduction in demand for Euro 6 because of this uncertainty, or, or are the Euro 6 doing well at the moment? Yeah, so, so I, I, guess, I guess the risk around uncertainty is, is actually, you know, people won't take any chances or try something new, so you almost go back to the traditional option. Um, I, I, think, I think from my point of view, um, you know, a, a scenario and a better scenario for kind of governments and, you know, or, um, you know, local authorities would be take, actually, let's look at things from an outcome perspective. Mm. Um, so even if you're looking at something like, you know, if you're looking at, I want to reduce CO2, yeah. I want to reduce particulates, that's my outcome. How are we going to do it? You know, actually let nice. the industry kind of work that out. So we don't go down the route of actually we're, we're polluting more because we're using the wrong kind of vehicle, but it, mm. it, it's because we've mandated this particular kind of vehicle. I think also that probably flows into things like, you know, vision standards. Um, again, you know, if, if those kind of things are more outcome driven, um, you know, number one, you use the technologies which we have in the right way to achieve the outcome. And secondly, um, you know, does it drive more innovation and, and different ways of doing it, rather than saying we've got to have a camera here and a, you know, a window in the door and, you know, those kind of things. So I, I think, you know, we, we probably need to look at those kind of things. But you're, you're absolutely right. I think uncertainty is not, not the right thing. Yes. I mean, we heard this morning a lot about the, uh, the UK triple platooning trial and um, Thomas just mentioned mm -hmm. Brexit. Do you have a concern that uh, if the UK leaves Brexit, leaves the EU, that we're going to have very different approaches to platooning in different countries around the EU? And uh, does that, again, lead to uncertainty and a lack of clarity about adoption about which way things are going? Are you concerned about that as well? Um, actually, interesting question. We constantly get asked, obviously, from our headquarter in Munich, um, where are we heading to? Honestly speaking, I can't answer this. But maybe from a different angle, maybe it's an opportunity. If you, if you talk about um, low entry, direct vision, camera systems, obviously within the EU, we need a legal basis to get rid of the mirrors and put camera systems in. I personally think camera systems are a better solution. Mm. But within the EU, it's going to take decades to get the situation. And maybe, uh, considering Brexit, then UK can decide internally and to take from this angle the view on the Brexit, maybe it even accelerates some processes. However, there need to be uh, politicians being willing to take quick and fast decisions supporting the commercial vehicle industry. So uh, it's a chance as well as a risk, but uh, there are opportunities, definitely. Phil, so you're obviously leading the, the UK triple team trial. As, as I say, is this going to be a purely UK solution or will it go across Europe, you think? Uh, I would hope that in the automotive sector, and I, and I think it's been demonstrated that it, it, we, we do are working to much more around global uh, and international standards. They're, they're not just restricted to the EU today anyway. So one would hope uh, that with such an interconnected uh, automotive sector that we will have consistent standards. And, and I mean, whilst uh, DAF is obviously a UK-based manufacturer, um, uh, we will be uh, supporting the UK trial from our head office in Eindhoven. Uh, and of course, we are a global company. Um, PACAR, which is DAF's owner, also has Kenworth and Peterbilt brands in the United States. And we share technology across all of those, those different global platforms. So I, I see this as being transferable. I think what's really encouraging, and we heard from Rob this morning from TRL, 
well, is that the UK is actually, this trial is about doing the due diligence in the specific local market, which is really important uh, to ensure that we understand the, the real business case for platooning here on the UK roads, and that's what the objective is all about. And I think we've got to praise the government, really, for, in this instance, actually in, informing itself, and informing the public, and informing us on the benefits and the risks associated mm. with platooning based on actual operational trials on UK roads. Uh, Martin, we were talking earlier about the benefits of platooning. You were saying you know, it's not simply going to be a fuel benefit, it has to be a step towards driverless vehicles. Is that yeah, the, 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 thing? the key thing with platooning, and I'm sure it will come out of the trials, is that the benefit on the fuel consumption will be modest. You know, I would expect to see around about 5%. Um, and probably that, the other thing to bear in mind is that that won't be 5% on every vehicle. The vehicle at the front will have a higher fuel consumption, the vehicle at the back will have a higher fuel consumption, the guys in the middle get the best fuel consumption. Whilst we're doing trials which are one manufacturer specific, running with a, a trial of maybe three or four vehicles, um, relatively that's quite straightforward. The challenge then comes, and the bit where we must have international collaboration, is that if we want to do a trial where there's an MAN, a DAF, an Iveco, and a Scania all in a line, and we want to jumble them up in whichever way we want and get them to react and perform properly together, that's a big challenge. There's a challenge to set up the protocols to do it, which is one thing, but then to do the tuning together to actually make it work, and that my vehicle reacts at the same rate as the others react, um, is a big thing to, and we shouldn't underestimate how much work is needed to make that work. Um, then you get to the issue, and um, it, it, the other thing which comes out of it is that um, if I'm DHL, whoever, and I'm running 10 vehicles, five vehicles, all in a line, it doesn't matter which is the front vehicle, which is the middle vehicle, because DHL will get the benefit. But if it's four different operators joining a platoon, who gets the benefit? So you have to have a, a mechanism for sharing the fuel consumption benefit. You can't have a, a system where the poor guy who's on the front takes the hit and the guy in the middle gains all the benefit. You've got to make the way where you get that to be even. Then we get onto the more complicated bits about how do we decide who makes the decision about what these vehicles do in the event of an incident? What does the driver do? So I have a driver who's sitting there doing nothing in the middle vehicle, at which point somebody breaks the platoon and he's got to take over. Is he ready? Is he awake? Is he actually paying attention? Um, that's some of the sort of things which need to come out of the trial, and it'll be interesting to see the results. So, what's, uh, Aris, what, what's Scania's view of platooning? Are you taking part in trials anywhere around Europe? And are you concerned that there are going to be different standards in different parts of the world if we're not careful? Yeah, no, absolutely. So, so yeah, absolutely, we, we are taking part. And, you know, Scania has got, uh, you know, quite a bit of platooning, uh, platooning ongoing. Um, I, I, I'm going to kind of get, I take quite a positive view on it, actually. So I'm, I'm quite an optimist in terms of, you know, the, you know, the utilisation of technology and advancements of technology to kind of move things forward. Um, so, in, you know, you can already see, I guess, in, in the car world, things like, you know, automation and, you know, cars driving themselves. But I guess if you take that into truck world, obviously, you know, these are bigger vehicles, they're heavier vehicles. We, you know, we have to be significantly more, even more safety conscious because if something goes wrong, it's, it's, a, it's a bigger, bigger problem. Um, however, if you sort of bring that into, in, you know, in, into today, um, you know, we know that um, the difference between a good driver driving a vehicle and a, and a bad driver driving a vehicle, um, you know, is a massive difference in fuel. And, and that equals kind of carbon dioxide, that equals uh, pollutants, you know, all those kind of things. Um, so actually, you know, first of all, can we use technology to kind of, you know, I guess, equalize between good driving and bad driving? Um, and actually, so that's still a driver in control, but the technology is helping you. Um, and then sort of coming into, um, you know, uh, things like platooning. Um, obviously, from a, again, coming from looking at it from a car world, um, you know, cars are, in you know, many instances, able to drive themselves. So, you know, to, to, to look at some of the scenarios, you know, a, a truck decides to come out of the platoon or an incident happens, um, you know, I almost see it in terms of, is the driver ready? If the driver's not ready, um, you know, the truck can have some sort of design in there 
from a safety point of view, what do I do in that in that scenario? I pull over into the side and, and I stop, you know, but we can probably do that using today's technology and obviously tomorrow will be even even you know more more advanced. Great. Hmm. Okay, we've got literally one more minute to fill, so I'm going to ask you two questions. I'd like as close to a one word answer to each as possible. Would you like to see a government scrappage scheme to encourage the take up of clean and more modern vehicles? And do you think it's likely at all? We'll start with Arif. Sorry, I, I didn't catch the question, sorry. Would you like to see a scrappage scheme to encourage operators to buy more modern, cleaner vehicles? And do you think it's at all possible in the UK? I'm gonna, I'm gonna sit on the fence on that one and put a, put a question mark, sorry. <laughs> I'll be much more black and white about it, no. We had a scrappage scheme um, five years ago on um, cut of the vans at three and a half tons. Um, we did 20 vehicles over a year. Why so few? Because the scrappage scheme was saying 10 year old vehicles come off the road to be replaced by brand new. The guy running a 10 year old van can't even aspire to having a brand new van. He aspires to having a five year old van. The same will apply in trucks, a 10 year old truck the owner is never going to buy a brand new one. So a scrappage scheme, unless you can do a two-stage scrappage scheme, and I've absolutely no idea how you could do that bureaucratically, but you can't do a scrappage scheme to replace a 10-year-old vehicle with a brand new one. Phil? No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And I, sorry, just to sort of caveat that. So, uh, yeah, there's, there's too much of a gulf between an old vehicle, and it's really the very old vehicles, the Euro 3s, the Euro 2s, those are the most polluting, and if the government wants to do anything to clean up air quality as soon as possible, we must get those on. And as a number of people have expressed, the gulf from that to a new vehicle is too great. So maybe a way where we could actually defer the clean air zones to enable Euro 5 used vehicles to continue at a lower charge, maybe a more practical mm. way of allowing operators of the oldest vehicles to make a, a, a more manageable step to a, a, a cleaner, even though it's not the ultimate Euro 6, but to a cleaner vehicle. Very sensible. Thomas? Yes and no. Yes, from an OEM point of view, it will give us a boost on volume, which is great. Yes, from the environmental point of view, it will support, obviously, the clean air. No, from a truck operator's point of view, because I did face the issue when I run Germany that there will be a huge strain on your balance sheet, because immediately, once you have a scrappage fee on incentive for Euro 6 technologies, every emission class below will immediately suffer, and the residual values will plummet down. So mm. the asset, the balance sheets will suffer big time, which was a big issue for the operators. That's fantastic. Well, we're out of time. Thank you very much indeed, gentlemen, for your input. You. It's very, very valuable to hear from you all. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Steve. Thank you.